for those of you that don't know why or what you're doing here, um, <laughs> I've done these for years. It's a meetup is just everywhere I go, um, I at least afford an hour just to answer questions or to help people meet other people, leverage my relationship capital. Uh, what I found by doing this is that the most valuable thing is I learn what people are listening for. More than all the lives and everything, when you meet people and get an understanding of, hey, this is what frequency people are at, what is critical for them, and then be able to address that to amplify it to many, it's really valuable for me as well. Uh, kind of akin to uh, Jay Leno used to speak 100 speeches a year. Uh, because he wanted to see what people were listening for, what was funny, and so in practice. Uh, so, you know, it's a duality. I get as much out of this, if not more, by having you show up. So I want to first just thank you for showing up. And, you know, whatever you need, questions are great. If you need introductions to someone, I'm one degree of separation from most people. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing here. The first question is always the hardest. That's why. Philip's sitting way back there. He's afraid I'll ask him to ask the first question. Uh, but if anyone kind of wants to start, just give me your name and a question or a comment or a concern, and I'd love to help. Peter. Peter, good to see you. So how, how was that new stadium? Oh, well, first of all, you're all invited. I, I have my office in podcast studio at SoFi. Um, and so it's extraordinary. It's probably the greatest stadium that I've been in. Um, I'm blessed to have my office and podcast studio, but the sound system especially, that scoreboard, whatever that thing, the billion dollar uh, screen and sound system. So if you can see a concert or a game there, it's an experience regardless of whether you even like the people performing or the teams playing. So it's extraordinary. And, uh, I've, I've got a client I drive by there. They're in uh, downtown or south central LA. Oh, so wow. I drive by that every time I go. Well, let us know. Come in. Well, I was planning to go up there one day, and then yeah. the meeting got canceled. Oh, uh, July 20th will be the next time. We're traveling till then. So that's next week, I think, All right, cool. on Wednesday. So if anybody wants to swing by, just email me. We'll put you on the list. We'll give you a tour of the stadium. Sweet. Yeah, awesome. Hey, hey, what's going on? Good. All right, next question. Oh, you? I want to start. How do you determine what NFTs are worth something compared to you know, the ones that are actually worth money and the ones that are not? Yeah, so I think people you know, look at all technology in different ways. And so you know, if we look back at Web 1.0, which I was blessed to be involved with, 99% of the companies in the internet failed. And most people told me the internet was going to fail. And because they couldn't decipher the capabilities of the internet with the company objectives that were involved in the internet early on. And most were just too early because we didn't understand what capabilities really were valuable. So when Justice Scalia told me that nobody will ever do research on the internet, that you need books, I don't make fun of Justice Scalia by saying that. It's just a good example of a mindset of an extremely intelligent human being that sat on our Supreme Court of the United States that in no way could fathom how somebody could use a computer to do research. And the reason was is the capabilities of the internet at that time weren't as convenient as reading a book and he wasn't used to it, which made it more cumbersome. Same thing with Web 2.0, right? People would tell you, I was CEO of Samsung's first phone and they told me nobody would ever be able to call China for free in color in full duplex, which means you can interrupt people. And they said, there's no way that would ever happen. But yet, the wireless and Web 2 exists today, but most of those companies, including the very first smartphone, doesn't exist, and nobody's using iPhone 4s for good reason, because it's capability-driven. Web 3.0, which NFTs are a part of Web 3.0, but I want to make it inclusive of everything, Web 3.0, blockchain and NFTs and crypto all have great capabilities. Um, but NFTs, unfortunately, launched the ca one capability that has always been around uh, that creates markets really fast, and it's called collectibles. So regardless of your technology, for example, I know that I would love to have a Honus Wagner baseball card, and technology was completely different in printing the original Honus Wagner baseball card. Now that's a very valuable collectible for those people that don't know baseball. It's one of the first baseball cards ever done and he's the greatest player at that time. 
way over. So the capabilities of collectibles are what? Supply and demand. That's the only capability of a collectible. So people that are defining NFTs as a collectible, then they would look to the capability of, okay, an NFT that's a collectible would have the same exact capability as a Honus Wagner baseball card from years and years and years and years ago. Because a collectible's capability is only supply and demand. When there's only one of something, it's and there's an emotional attachment, there's extreme value to it. There's extreme demand for it. But where you'll see NFTs going is where you'll see the rest of blockchain going is in the capability, not the collectible. So I see NFTs as a capable, not a collectible. And I think if more people look at the capabilities of whatever it is they're examining, skills, knowledge, and desire that they have aligned with the capability. So for example, Justice Scalia's skills, knowledge, and desire was not aligned with the capability of the internet to do legal research at that time. Now, if he had lived long enough, it became so easy, the user interface became so easy, the speed came so easy, the accuracy became so easy, he probably would have changed his mind and said, oh, internet's a great way to do legal research. But when it was a Boolean language search in a DOS environment, with a 9600 bow modem with dial-up service, his skills, knowledge, and desire were not aligned with the capability of internet. So I want everyone to think about NFTs in capability, not collectability. If you're interested in the collectability of NFTs or anything else, I can help you with that too, understanding your timing and risk tolerance, your skills, your knowledge, and desire, and the collectible capability of whatever, you know, the V friends or you know the BAPES or whatever great NFT you want to buy, but then we can determine who the market is, the market makers, and the margins available by the collectible capability, not the capability itself of the technology. And I went a little bit more in depth on that because I think that holds true for all investment. So, so what do you see as an application? So for instance, like the blockchain. Real estate. Uh, I, any, any membership has great application. I think it's going to change the face of real estate. Hi guys, yeah, and, and let me explain why. I already am investing in a company that allows you for $100 to make a fractionalized ownership in a building like that. It democratizes the ability of people can make really good money where only before the rich people could make that kind of money and mitigate your risk and align and, and learn about how that happens. And you can imagine if you're 17 years old and, and you have $1,000 and your first real estate investments in that building right there, and it's completely liquid and the market's made by the capabilities of NFTs, then you all of a sudden turn that into $5,000. Now the, the rich guys put in a million or 10 million and turn it to five or 50 million, right? That's how wealth is gained, but now we give this 17 year old kid $5,000 and he continues to understand the capability as well as the really wealthy guy who's putting in 10 million. And now the 5,000, right, gets five times earning. Now he has $25,000 and then the 25,000 turns to 125. Then it turns into a million to five by the time he's 28, 10 years. So you got a 28 year old that understands the capabilities of NFTs and he now has $1.25 million. This has created opportunities that have never been created. And this is for a kid that maybe saved $1,000. I almost said for a paper route, but that capability is gone. So $1,000, you know, working at one of these Shake Shacks, which is not outrageous. That was never available for me. To be able to leverage, you know, the absolute le advantage of being rich in America to down to $100 to allow the financial literacy and the experience of buying and selling and liquidity and markets and market makers and margins and all those great lessons. So, you know, real estate, I think memberships are another great one. The liquidity of an equity membership for country clubs or plane memberships or wherever you see a subscription or membership, the capabilities of NFTs are completely applicable to allowing you any place where there has to be a market, a broker and fees that you now can take that out of the equation and then lower the bar to democratize the owner of it so that all of us could share in a farms membership now and equitably be able to have access to it according to the percentage of ownership and be completely liquid. 
right? So if I have a hard time or I, you know, want to, I'm not going to play golf anymore or whatever and I want to sell mine, it doesn't affect any of you, right? I've just sold my two weeks uh, or, you know, six rounds or whatever it is. It gives such more value and capability and access to things. And those are some of the capabilities of where I see it. Great questions, very important. Okay, good. That's what I'm here for. All right, next question. Yes, sir. Name first so everyone knows you. Patrick. Have you seen the uh, Proto, formerly named Proto hologram up there? I have. I would like to recreate Will Rogers, uh, do a recreation of Will Rogers uh, on the Proto, maybe place it in a high traffic location like uh, the Tulsa Airport where he's Very out. popular, yeah. Um, what business model might you wrap around that to fund it? I imagine it requires 500 to a million in funding. Yeah, I mean, I, I know a person who does those. So, um, you know, Dan Fleischman, who I mentor, is, is involved in that as well. Um, but I do understand the sponsorship side of it. So what you do, in any case scenario where you have something as an attraction. So an attraction attracts people. If you attract people, there's a market because we can message, communicate, gather data, get a high level branding, recognition, awareness, votes, wh whatever it may be. And so when I analyze any of these situations, and I don't know the exact cost, but I can introduce you to find out how exactly we could do this. But what I do is I say to myself, okay, what is the traffic, both real traffic and virtual traffic? Because remember, one of the things that exists on stuff like this that goes beyond the actual, I'm old, right, what I call the actual activation is the amplification. So uh, I'll use my favorite example to self-promote myself. Uh, I wanted to um, bucket list. I travel a lot, 200 days a year. I always wanted to be in the centerfold of like American Way magazine. You know, I take the airline, I'm like, dude, I'm more new. You know, I'm Dave Meltzer. What do you mean they put this guy in here? You know, so what if he started Netflix? Come on. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it was a bucket list ego item for me. And lo and behold, they called me and said, hey, we'd like to feature you in American. I believe in manifestation. And so they're like, we'd like to, to feature you in this. What months do you want? And of course, you get to pick two months because they're in a row. Those magazines come out six times a year in the, in the thing. So I said, of course, December and January. Right, because my ego wouldn't let it go that more people travel during those times. I should always know when my ego is involved, I'm making a huge mistake. So anyway, of course, instead of taking you know February and March, I get December and January during COVID. <laughs> the you know, universe loves to laugh at you. So my activation of me being in a magazine, right, failed miserably because only people that even reached out to me were people who already knew me that ironically somehow were still traveling in December and January. And they were like, hey, people who already love me, I love the article, congratulations. Well, it didn't do what I wanted it to do. And especially didn't do for my ego what it wanted it to do. So in this case, right, that's an activation. But where I did get extreme value is today and the other hundred times that I've told this story, the only difference is I don't have the magazine with me because usually if I'm telling the story, I hold up the magazine so you can see it. Now, thousands of people will call and be like, oh man, dude, you were in the, in the American Way, man. How do I get the, oh, that's amazing. You're incredible. You're just like Mark Randolph. Oh my gosh. Well, so my ego gets stroked as well. But I'm teaching truly a lesson of humility, one, and amplification, two. So what is so unique about an activation in Tulsa that may or may not get enough eyeballs there to warrant a sponsorship in effect, if the activation is unique enough because of the way it's presented, and then we capture it, modify it, amplify it, and perpetuate it, you now have a much better business case to raise millions of dollars against it. Because why? Because we can bring all types of old cowboys there and, and do like interactive stuff with them and then they post it and then you bring TikTokers there to do that and they post it and then all of a sudden you've accumulated millions and millions and millions and millions of people and you know Firestone is so stoked about it or whoever it is because they're part of the activation or you find something, I don't know the history as well. I mean, equally so it could go into LAX 
Texas, well, anywhere. The start of Route 66, named after. Him. Yeah, anywhere, right? But right. the good news is, it's not about the activation anymore. It's about the amplification of the application, and then your ability to articulate the quantitative value of both because you're selling against an audience and an emotional attachment. The more people, the more credibility you have, the more emotionally attached because we then align with people that are huge fans, right? A huge fan of Justin Herbert's gonna pay him a lot more money to endorse something than someone that's a Raiders fan. So, and I can help you with that as well. Great uh, example. Thank you for doing this. Of course. I, First so, name, so I'm everyone knows you. Shiloh. Nice Shiloh. I, I believe in manifesting too. I'm new to it, so I haven't seen anything actually cool. come up yet. But how how do you go about raising capital or even just startup money? I feel like I have great ideas, mm -hmm. but maybe I'm too new at it where it's like the biggest jump is just the funds. Yeah. So this is a great question um, because believe it or not, you need funds to launch something. Mm -hmm. And I think that realization of staying in business that I always first in a business want to stay in business. So I have to determine, am I going to be in business tomorrow? Do I have enough money to stay in business tomorrow? And if I can do that, then I can allow the manifestation to take its time as long as I'm in business. I don't even define business as an entity or a name. Like I believe that is, although I lost over a hundred million dollars and yes, bankrupt some of my businesses in my person that the business I'm in today is part of what I did yet then, right? It, it's just a different name and I have made back what I lost and will continue to help other people make back more without losing it, which is even a greater gift that wouldn't have been given unless I lost it all and learned the lessons to give. Manifestation is really simple in my mind and raising money is different in the respect of manifestation. So let's start with manifestation. In order to manifest what you want, know what you want. So we all start with nothingness. The minute you think about what you want, this is why I have the five daily practices, you take nothingness, no chance. If you don't know what you want, you have no chance of manifesting this. You get that? Because a lot of people, they think they get that, but then they wake up every day and they don't know what they want, personally, experientially, giving and receiving wise. They haven't taken the time to take nothing and put it, all they say is, oh, I want to be successful. I want to know my why. That's not knowing what you want. Like knowing I want a yellow car with tan interior is knowing what you want. And the minute I say it, think it, believe it, feel it, I go from zero to a possibility, a mathematical advantage every day. So if you want to raise money for a business, then say, I want to raise a minimum of a million dollars for my real estate app. Do everything you can today aligned with that, say everything today aligned with that, think everything a day aligned with that, believe it. How do we determine if we truly believe it or not? By the percentage of time that you are out of belief, meaning the percentage of time that you're scared, separate, inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, angry, guilty, resentful, or you feel interfered with. You take 24 hours in a day that you're given and if you spend two hours in fear, you know exactly quantifiably how much belief you have. That's how I determine my belief, where it's at. Yeah, so <laughs> belief is determined by how much time you spend in fear each day. The only real time is today. 24 hours today is real. All, all time before today is relative. So I can take any event in my life, horrific ones or great ones, and make it whatever I want to make it. Bankruptcy is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Ta-da! I just changed it. No, that's the past. In the future, the same way. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to empower over a billion people and change the world. Pa! That's awesome. It's relative. But today, I'm stuck in 24 hours. So I want to be pragmatic about my time. I want to know what I want, who I can help, who can help me, how to get it done. Prioritize accordingly in a trajectory towards these unrealistic, relative things and apply my why as if they're already there. And so when I know what I want, I have a possibility. When I know who can help me and who I can help with what I want, it's a probability because now I've made it inspired. See, you're motivated by what, but you're inspired by who? In spirit, right? You're a spirit, I'm a spirit, we're in spirit. So if I know who I can help and who can help me, I've taken a pragmatic possibility and made it a probability, a mathematical advantage in raising a million dollars for my real estate app. 
because I've actually been more interested than interesting, putting the five levels of attention of doing everything, saying everything, thinking everything, believing everything, and now feeling inspired, feeling confident that it's gonna happen according to quantifiable time. The more time I spend in confidence, the more time I spend inspired, the greater the productivity, accessibility, and gratitude that exists, the greater statistical success of it actually happening faster. Or if it doesn't happen, then that's where for me faith really comes in because if that doesn't happen, then something better happened. Now, I may not understand better because if somebody would have told me in 2008 that better was getting my ass kicked out of every property that I ever owned and you know, living in a rented house with rented furniture, a pregnant wife and one car after living in Rancho Santa Fe in 33 homes in San Diego, if somebody would have said that was better, I would have said, I have no faith. How could that ever be better? But guess what? I will honestly tell you that if, but for that occurrence, I would either be divorced at minimum, which isn't worth all that to me, knowing what I know now, after 25 years of marriage to the, you know, my wife, and then two, most likely, not guaranteed, I'd be dead. Definitely not worth it. So, but for the meaning that I give this circumstance, of what it is by learning the lessons from what happens, but that bankruptcy was better for me than me to continue my success. I have faith that there's something bigger than me that loves me more than my mom. It is always protecting and promoting me, but I just don't know what I don't know. My quote of the day or lesson of the day was, don't substitute what you know for what you don't know. Don't exchange it. People do it all the time. They exchange what they don't know for what they do know. What's that mean? So, I, I, I don't know the future of going bankrupt. So I wanted to exchange what I don't know. This is the worst thing ever. Did I know it was the worst thing ever? Obviously not. But people do it all the time, don't we? We give meaning to everything we see. And so we start exchanging what we do know, which was, hey, I lost everything, I made some mistakes, I have to learn to trust and vet, I should have you know, known more about, asked for help, whatever these great lessons that I've learned, been more grateful, appreciative of what I had, I need to be a better father, a better husband, like all the things that I learned, those are things I did know. But what I did know was why it was better, right? And I wanted to exchange something worse for what I did know, which was factually, I, I need to improve and pursue my potential better or listen or ask for help or, or be more interested or practice identifying fear or whatever these things that I've evolved today. People exchange what they do know for what they don't know and most of the time that they exchange what they don't know is for something worse, not for something better. I just have faith that it's better and I don't know what is gonna be better and nor do I care because I have so much faith and I only spend minutes and moments out of belief not days, weeks, months, and years like I used to. Minutes and moments, because I've trained myself over 16 years to practice identifying fear, stopping, not resisting it, breathing, and then reminding, remembering, and recollecting to the great source what I want, who I can help, who can help me, how best I can get that done, prioritize accordingly, and applying my why. I have more energy today than I did 20 years ago, but I actually have the exact same amount of energy I'm just doing I have less interference to the energy I've always had. And so do you. And so do you. So to manifest what we want, know what you want to make it a possibility, know who you can help and who can help you to make it a probability, then use strategy, which will create better lessons, awareness, and discipline. I believe in the consistent nature of understanding manifestation. I believe in the aggregate effect, compound interest of behavior, attention and intention. I believe that what you pay attention to consistently and give intention to, what you do, say, think, believe and feel, equals the coincidence in your life, or better. I'm different than most manifestors. Like I don't believe necessarily you're John Asseroff and you could put a house in Del Mar on a vision board and end up buying that exact house. But I do believe that you can put that house on your vision board and give it your intention and get better than that house. Equal to or better. And if you have the right perspective, you'll say, wow, I can manifest anything. And then you're saying, why did I limit myself? I should have put a better picture up there. This is true. 
So knowing what you want gives a possibility, knowing who you can help and who could help you, a probability, knowing discipline, strategy, and awareness, that practice of daily practices of applying your why will make it your perspective. Once it's your perspective, it's your reality. You've manifested it. If you feel attacked or you want to understand accountability at its fullest, I used to live in a short, scarce world of, you know, and I thought I was, you know, so brilliant when I went bankrupt. Like, what did I do to attract this as a newcomer to manifestation in the law of attraction? What did I do to attract this to myself? And what am I supposed to learn from it? But what I realized was that was a world of punishment still, not promotion and protective, because I was doing something that would attract something that hurt me. But instead, I've now rephrased that to, what did I do to participate in this perception, right? Because that's my reality, my perception. We can, as two of us, never perceive something exactly the same way. And then two, what did I do to participate in this perception? And then what am I supposed to learn from that perception? See, we can change perception much easier than changing what we think is real. So you might as well change the meaning of things so that you then can perceive them in a different way. Every relationship you have can be perceived in a different way. It's whether, once again, I reconcile time. Is it worth my time to find the light, the love, and the lessons in this relationship? When there's so many other options, opportunities, and touches of favor of people that I'd rather spend time with. Because why? I only deal in time today. So today, I'm spending my time with all of you for an hour because it, I am prioritizing finding the light, the love, and lessons in all of you. Even though I have my wife here with me and, you know, yes, I want to spend, but it's a prioritization of time every day. I'm in a trajectory for tomorrow and guess what? I get to change my mind in the morning. I, I hire fast learners. What does that mean? I have hired people that make a shitload of mistakes. One time it's a mistake, two times it's a habit. So I have people that are forming really good behaviors and habits that are aggregating on themselves, accelerating and growing exponentially in a collective now, not just as individuals. All of you have this power. Make your possibilities, your probabilities, your probabilities, your perspective. And the last piece of advice is do not attach your emotions to time. You should attach your emotions to the quantified space time continuum the man-made constructs that we have is for today because they're real if you have an appointment at three o'clock that's real so you have to prioritize according to time and attach your emotions today to any time or space or distance that exists today yes it's exactly 47 miles to my next place I can't change that today, but I can change a whole bunch of things tomorrow, right here in my mind. But you can't change it today. So make sure that we're utilizing the quantifiable constructs to be efficient, effective, and statistically successful today in a trajectory to unrealistic, audacious, unbelievable goals in the future. The minute you attach your emotions to a future time, not today, you're creating resistance. Let me tell you why. If you tell me you need to make a million dollars by the end of July, one second after you've said that, you're short on time. One week, you're shorter on time. Three weeks from now, you're shorter on time. Now, if you tell me I want to double the amount of money I make as fast as I can, you've taken out all the resistance, the shortages, the voids, and the opposite, obstacles. The minute you say I want more than this, I, I'm a more than, I, I, some of you may have heard this story, but it really changed my life. I was blessed to share my Lakers seek, uh, tickets with Diane Cannon right on the baseline. Lakers bench, Magic, me, Diane Cannon, Glenn Fry, and his wife. Best seats right next to Jack. And I told Diane Cannon, who's one of my mentors, she's 86 right now, I said, Diane, I'm gonna live to 111. And I was, you know, kind of, showing her like I, I believe in these outrageous future things I said I was born on January 11th at 111 I'm gonna die on January 11th at 111 when I'm 111 years old and she got teary-eyed and looked at me I'm like what's the matter she goes why are you limiting yourself what if technology in the next 50 years you won't even be a hundred when I told her I wouldn't be you won't even be a hundred yet 
What if technology makes the average person live to a thousand and for 50 years you're manifesting, you're thinking, saying, doing, believing that you're dying at 111? You're going to cheat yourself out of 889 years. We do that all the time. To live over 111. <laughs> I'm gonna live to more than 111. Yeah, it's, it's easy. There's no, right, that takes out all the resistance. And we do that all the time to ourselves. And I see people do it with deals, right? And then they get more and more desperate, more and more scarce. And guess what? That energy creates more resistance to the deal happening. Instead of, because people feel that. Remember, intentions created by what you do, so you can do everything. What you say, you can say everything correctly. What you think, you can think everything. Believe, right? The majority of your time, you believe it. But if your feeling is not aligned with what you do, say, think, believe, you actually, the intention doesn't work mathematically. How many times have we met someone and said, oh, there's something off? And we think it might be the deal. But meanwhile, little did you know that their wife was yelling at him before they got to the meeting and they were super excited about your meeting, but they couldn't get that energy out of the way. So they weren't feeling aligned with everything that previously they had done, said, think and believe. This is why I shift my energy all the time. I literally will walk into even a family function and this has really happened to me. I went to a family function. My mom, like, just kind of, looked at me and then my nephew who you know adores me like looked through me and I'm like whoa I'm leaving Julie who's here now right I'm gonna say what I'm like I'm gonna go outside shift my energy right I'm at a different frequency this isn't right so I walked out stopped I didn't overanalyze it, out logic it. Oh my God, did my mom know that I did this to her when I was 17, that I stole the money out of her purse? Oh shit, you know? Like this is the old Dave that used to do this, right? Arms and legs growing and now I'm carrying even worse energy, staying. I just stopped, breathed, got back to center to neutral, reminded myself my mom just wants to know that I'm happy, healthy. I love her and appreciate her. Make sure that that intention is aligned. So does my nephew, and I want to make sure that he's happy, healthy, that he loves me and appreciates me. Make sure that intention's aligned. Got it aligned. I walk back in, in a different feeling. Same action, same words, same thoughts, and same beliefs, but now a different feeling. And my mom lights up when I walk in the room. She wasn't even looking at me anymore. She felt me and whipped around. We've seen that when your energy's right. You light up a room, people just whip around, and then my nephew just ran up and gave me a big hug. All energetic. I do that in business meetings, I do it on telephone calls. It drives salespeople crazy that I've coached in the years. They're like, I've called him six times. He never answers, blah, 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 blah. Right? I'm like, oh, hold on. Right? I, this is gonna be effortless. Right? I'm completely confident it's gonna come at the right way at the perfect time and I dial and the guy answers. And the sales guy's like. And then the conversation is effortless. Jake travels with me a lot back there and he, he's had this experience. When you're in the flow, like, and it started with, I was thinking of someone and they texted me. And then so, some very similar type of coincidence happened to Jake. And I looked at Jake and I hit him. I said, stop everything. He goes, what? I go, go make, closing calls. He's like, what? I'm all, if there's anybody you have to close for a deal, if they haven't get, call them right now. And he's looking at me like, what are you talking about? We're in the flow, bro. We're in the flow. And literally, do we close deals? Yeah, that was a great day. <laughs> That's stuff that nobody teaches or believes in. I do and it works. Because I understand the, the flow, the interference, that I'm, if your mom was God, imagine what you would get. And you would trust it a lot more than if you believe in a source. Like if your mom knew everything and she said, you know what, I don't think you should uh, go to college at that school. I think you should go to this school. And you knew your mom knew everything? As much as she loves you, I'd follow it. That's the shift in the paradigm and the perspective that I have with my faith. Because I believe that can't prove it but I believe that and it keeps working in my favor so
All right, great questions. Who's next? Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, my name is Ari. Thank you, Ari. I like your shirt. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I just was wondering, is it, is it possible, or have you ever seen it happen, where you can actually manifest uh, change in other people, people who work with you? For instance, uh, you said discipline, right? And mm -hmm. that immediately popped in my head as one of the fundamental sort of features that one of my business partners is lacking, that I, I'm trying to get them to become more disciplined yeah. in their craft. Yeah. So we, we cannot affect change in anyone that doesn't, and in the spiritual world, they say give you permission. So if you get permission, so that's why I teach the first qualifier of all human beings I come in contact with, especially in any sales situation, is an open mind. Because it takes a thousand times minimum the energy to re-engineer a closed mind than it does an open mind. Now, I'm extremely optimistic about open minds. I believe everyone on earth has an open mind at some time. I try to find the people that have an open mind the majority of the time and run away from the people that have closed minds the majority of the time. But this is why we can look at certain people and say, I can't believe anybody ever loved Hitler. Well, I can, because I'm sure he had an open mind at certain times to certain individuals and that forced them to go, oh, he's not a bad guy. He's open-minded. Of course, because everyone has an open mind at certain times, but we want not only to find open minds majority of the time, but open minds that are aligned with our values that we have. So you cannot manifest change in someone else, but you can ask one uh, when they have an open mind, if you can assist them with a different perspective. Different perspective is change. And so the way that we do that is through articulating the credibility that we may have according to the change that we want to make, the emotional attachment because of our relationship, and then hopefully be able to articulate a quantitative value to exceed what you're asking for. Those are usually the best mechanism to effectuate change in somebody else. But anybody that's a parent, right? You heard the saying what you resist persists. I don't try to change my kids. I try to understand them. So open-ended questions are the best way to find an open mind and open-ended questions are the best way to understand. So I love to say, I appreciate what you're thinking. Tell me why. Have you ever thought of this? Would it help you if I helped you with this? Would it help you if you did this? Could you see any reason not to try this? These are ways to parent. Now it drives my wife absolutely insane because in the aspect when she wants the kids to be disciplined and I'm sitting here going, well, it's scary. She needs to know this. She needs to pay for this. She needs to. I said, I understand that. But that me telling her is only going to create a greater resistance. And what I'm trying to do is keep an open mind, growing and thinking about things. And it's frustrating for other people because we're so used to being able to. Now, I do think there's also uh, some protective age uh, things that go on when we're talking about discipline. Right? I think it's okay uh, at certain ages that you just tell kids they can't do something or older people that may have dementia. There, there's exceptions to every single thing that I, that I would help somebody. But I know the more we understand, the better it is. And that we can't, unless we have permission to help someone change, they won't change. And unless they want to change, they'll never change. There's billions of dollars in dieting, billions of dollars in addiction. I, you know, I, one of my business partners was an alcoholic and I put him into so many detoxes and rehabs and all the programs were successful with guess what? The people who wanted to change. <laughs> all of them. Like they all worked. If the person actually was ready to make the change themselves. If they weren't, then all you got was blowing smoke up someone's ass and going back to the exact same behavior. And the same thing with your teenagers, right? They're gonna go. They gotta want to change themselves. And so the best way to get them to want to change is to get permission to help them and ask open-ended questions so you can change the way they look at things so the things they look at change. The only way we can help someone change the way they look at things is by asking them questions so that they change the way they look at it, not you telling them how to look at it. I mean, it's like telling a depressed person who literally biochemically is depressed and saying, come on, we both know how to be happy. Just look at the glass half full. 
Why are you spending so much time? You're gonna commit suicide? All you gotta do, look at the glass app. Come on. That's what people literally try to solve problems. Instead of saying, hey, what's bothering you? How do you feel today? What do you like about today? What don't you like about today? Would it help you if I did this? Would it help you if you read this? Would it help you? Could you see any reason you want to try this? This is how things get done. Not, oh, it's easy. Why are you making yourself a victim? It's easy. You're not a victim. You got everything. You know, people who have everything kill themselves too. But you can't just tell someone. You have to, and it's great in sales, right? My whole strategy in sales changed over the last 35 years to very specific sales techniques to overcome objections and to create the avatar and to call, like all these things that I've completely abandoned and said, bro, just show up, find open minds, ask what they're doing today pertaining, pertaining to solar, ask what they like about solar, what they don't like about solar, say, hey, would it help you if I introduce you to someone that could get you solar, or do you know anyone that could help me or might need solar? And we create a community of sponsors and power sponsors. And now that we have the amplification that Peter and I were talking about, right, now you got like, thousands of people that are sponsors and power sponsors and everybody can make money from helping or being of help to each other by codifying with a memorialization, not a binding agreement. So I use an overlap agreement. That is just a binding memorialization of, hey, if I help you raise that money, will you give me equity? Yeah, sure, Dave, I'd love to do that. Or if I, you help me, I'll give you 20% for a speaking engagement. And then I go ahead and send an email, not sign it. And then it just gets codified and collected under your and my name. And I'm like, oh, it was a guy at Delmar that uh, was looking to raise money for the real estate app. And I type it into Outlook and it brings up the email. And I say, hey, I got that guy. Will you still give me equity for bringing him in? Yeah, sure, Dave. No lawyers, no waste of time. If he doesn't give it, this means the next time I won't do it and he'll have to live with that activity and I'll, I'll live with mine. He'll come back to me tenfold. Why? Because I'm being protected and promoted. And he needed it more than me, but for every loss or, or those types of situations, there's double coming my way. Because I live in a world of more than enough, a value add world, not a zero sum world. Just because somebody cheats me doesn't mean I lost. It just means there's more room in my vessel. Losing is another form of acknowledgement. When we give away things, lose them, get it manipulated or stolen from us, exact same effect in life. It's an acknowledgement. You can only acquire the knowledge of what you have by not having it anymore. I'll repeat that. You can only know what you have by not having it anymore. It doesn't matter how you don't have it anymore. So there's three steps in the expansion of your vessel in your being. One is appreciation, which is obvious because if you appreciate things, they add value. So appreciate everything, find the light, the love, and the lessons. Just determine today, is it worth your time? But appreciate everything. Then acknowledge it. Go ahead, do whatever it takes to find out. Give it away, let it be stolen, lost, whatever it is, manipulated from you. Don't relieve any energy because you just received acknowledgement. You've acquired the knowledge of what you had. Only way to acquire the knowledge of what you have is to not have it anymore. And guess what? The third step is the one that everybody forgets. Once you've acknowledged what you've had, now you have a bigger vessel. So I was here, I appreciated it, it grew. Then I acknowledged it, I emptied it. I don't have it anymore, now I know what I had. Now I have better knowledge and more lessons to what? Ask for more. Oh. Who's gonna give me more? Oh, the infinity, the abundance, the more than enough of everything for everyone, the omniscient, all powerful, all knowing. Oh, now I have a bigger. Do you know how many people have ripped me off in my life? Stolen from me, manipulated me, lied to me, cheated me, probably as many as I did to them. <laughs> but I finally learned to ask for more in faith and learned that when I ask you for help, I'm adding value to your life. And when you help me, you're adding value to mine as well. It's a value add world we're living in. Feel comfortable receiving. Most people appreciate what they have. Good people appreciate what they have. They acknowledge it. They get it stolen, lost, and they give the rest away. And then they feel guilty to ask for more. Yeah, but if I did that, more people need it more than me. Oh, I'll be embarrassed to ask them for help. Oh, and guess what? Over a lifetime, their vessel, because they don't ask for more, dissipates, dissolves, and disappears. And they end their life needing to ask for help instead of 
being capable of giving help to many, many more because they've continued to ask for it. Don't dissipate, dissolve, and disappear who you are. All of you appreciate, all of you acknowledge, but ask for more. Don't waste what you've done. More questions. Yeah, I'm Hannah. Hi, Hannah. I'm part of a group that's changing the education system. Hannah's with Togethership, Julie. Isn't that ironic? Yeah. Do you know the name of the coach that's there? Uh, so look it up anyway. Yes. Yeah. So uh, you kind of, thank you for what you just shared. That was really amazing and beautiful. Um, I guess now we got to find more people like you to help us because you kind of answered it, but I'm still looking for a little more. Good. Depth, I guess on um, scaling. So we have this school in Orange County. We're just trying to change the paradigm of education, teaching kids the things that should have been taught in school, like the headset, heart set, mind, hand set, right? Um, and just trying to really take it viral. Yeah. So here's how we scale things. And I really simplify this for everyone. And I want you to build the programs uh, behind it. I think it's one thing that I've been able to do in my own businesses. Um, which is a testament to the people that are here from my company. So determinative upon your own business or your own objective, this is how things scale. You need them to shadow you, so people need to watch you. So for me, I do free trainings. Free trainings is the first step in scaling my empowerment of making money, helping people and having fun. The more people that watch or shadow, that's the first step. Then the, the next step is working with me. And so to scale, someone needs to watch what you're doing, then they need to work with you, which improves both of you. Because all of their situational knowledge, experience, and relationship capital now combines with yours, but they've witnessed how you think, do, say, feel, and believe, and now they are adding value to that by working with you and saying, hey, would it help you if I did this? Or have you ever thought about doing this way? Or I used to work at the Cheesecake Factory and they did this and it would apply to the Togethership School and you're like, whoa, I would have never even thought about it. But yeah, I see how that connects now. So we work with people and then we supervise. So now this person, after they're supervised, has someone shadow them, work with them, are supervised by them and drop off. Now I got three trees going, and then six trees going, and then 12 trees going. And so put that idea into the construct of how can I have people be aware of what I'm doing? How can they then be inspired to work with me so that we both are adding value and appreciating? And what supervisory uh, systems do I have in place so that we can scale? to the exponential value of whatever it is, from one school to two schools, two schools to four schools, four schools to eight schools. And it, in whatever aspect that is, now in business, I put money to it. So in my business, it's, I know in 90 days wa watching me, you should be able to work with me and break even on what I've invested in you. And then from here, working with me, I should be able to get you to three times earnings that's when I'll supervise you from three times earnings and then be able to in 180 to 360 days drop off where someone now can shadow you and do the same thing. So I know exactly how much time I'll give someone and so each step of the way if they're not able to get to break even in 90 days, I let them know, hey, there's probably a better place for you. Just as if, you know, I always use this as the obvious analogy if my friend, which he does, you know, owns the Cleveland Cavaliers and he likes me so much, he's like, you know what, Dave, play guard for us. <laughs> he probably has a time frame to realize that that may not be the best fit for me. My skills, my knowledge and desire may not be aligned with what's needed at that business. And that's okay. But somehow everybody thinks it's obvious when they look at me playing guard for the Cavs but they won't make the same obvious connection when it's someone that is in marketing in their business that just is as bad at being a marketer in their business as I am at playing guard for the Cavs. They're just out -leagued. Sports is just a lot easier to be able, number one, to articulate that and two, to recognize it. Right? There's certain people that only have certain capabilities and I try my best to align good people with their skills, knowledge and desire 
among, and it's been an advancement over the last five years because I used to try to make, think that everybody could do everything because I personally didn't even put it in the context of athletics. Nobody's gonna let me play guard in the NBA. So I shouldn't necessarily feel that I can make anyone be a marketer, a salesperson, a, an administrator for my business. Not everybody can do that at the level I need it done. If they want to do it for fun, there's plenty of places to go to do it, to have an internship or do whatever it is to, to learn how. Just like there's, you know, fantasy camps for guys like me. <laughs> right? It's true. Great questions. Any? Uh, I guess the fear is kind of finding the wrong people that aren't aligned, but you can't have you, Yeah, the, the alignment comes at that first stage, right? That's why that's the shortest amount of time. Gary likes to say Vaynerchuk, right, fire fast. I, I, I personally am a little step farther. It's like understand if it's a good fit, fat, and then try to find somewhere that is either internally or externally. Put them in a different position. So if I, in that case, within maybe nine hours, the owner of the Cavs would say, hey, Dave, you're better suited for fantasy camp. You know, you got 10 grand. I'd love to have you come. <laughs> Last question. Yes. Hi, I'm Taylor. Hi, Taylor. Hi. Um, my question is, what work have you done on yourself? Oh, I love this question. So the question is, what work have I done with myself to improve my focus? I study time. And the biggest advancement that I've made in focus is understanding what focus is and how it works. As I'm going to change... Hopefully, those who haven't heard this, I'm gonna rock your, your world with this one because it's think about a million years in the future. Put yourself somewhere a million years from now. Oh, I'm there. Billion years, go ahead. Oh, almost the same amount of time. So I started studying this and I realized that to be able to focus is the understanding of focusing on one thing and then using the speed of thought to refocus to that one thing but gather enough data from taking all these trips mentally or by thought that I can still coordinate the thoughts of where I traveled by thought with the activity that I'm doing in the primary focus. So while I'm talking to you, I can do my text messages and my emails at the same time because what I'll do is I'm focusing on my conversation with you, but at the same time, I'll use my thought to move to my email get enough data to, to get something from it and immediately go back to you. So my focus is a process of refocus where if I'm just doing my email and talking to you, now I've gotten so good at it, I hate to admit this on camera, like I do interviews and coaching while I'm doing my emails, like the virtual ones, right? Like, so if I'm doing coaching on StreamYard, I have a coaching group that I do every Monday and there's a lot of people on there, but like, I'll be listening to their question, but I'll be doing my emails, but I'm not doing them together. What I'm doing is I'm listening to what you're saying and then quickly going to my email, just going back and forth with my thought. And it appears because our speed of thought is so fast as if I'm doing two things at once. Because you can imagine if the speed of thought can move a billion years in a point one seconds, we can do a lot and it's a practice. But the practice is primarily, how can I stay focused on one thing and then refocus back and forth to several different things? So do you scan, do you scan the email and, you, and then you scan the person and then your attention is like flipping back and forth? So if you imagine a cartoon cards when they first came up with animation, remember they flipped the cards and because it moved so fast, it looked like it moved. So what, what I'm doing is moving it with my thoughts so fast back and forth that the animation is creating the entire email for me. But I'm not losing track because my speed of thought's so fast and I've practiced it that I don't have to lose attention to what I'm saying. So I still see my wife talking to Colleen and I see Warren over there and I see these two idiots with the, the backpack over here, but I haven't really changed my main focus on what I'm saying to you and looking in your eyes and staying present. But my mind is moving so fast with all of those things. But I'm always moving back to center first. So I'm not going from here in the conversation to Warren, over to them, over. It's always Warren back to Peter, back to Warren, back to my wife going like this. Come on, we're going to leave in three minutes, right? Your mom's waiting at the house. 
this practice gives you such efficiencies and it is a practice and I start by either putting your email in front of you while you're doing other things and just seeing it's a muscle but it's extraordinarily powerful in, in the focus world 